Hello, I am Daniel Weiser, the artistic director and co-founder of Classicopia. Uh, Marsha Colligan, the president, and I want to welcome you. And uh, it's our 21st year of doing concerts. We're certainly uh, it's a new way of doing them here through live stream. But we hope you might enjoy uh, this uh, set of uh, Jewish concerts we have coming up. Uh, this one is called Jewish Joys and Sorrows, uh, featuring some wonderful uh, music from the early part of the 20th century. We have some wonderful performers with us: uh, Eyal Bor on clarinet. Emmanuel Borowski violin, Francis Borowski on cello, Dara Fitzgerald also on violin, and Radames Santos on viola. Uh, great music coming up from uh, Prokofiev to Alexander Krein uh, to uh, Ernest Bloch and Joseph Akron. Uh, sit back and enjoy this wonderful program. Ah, first piece today uh, will feature uh, Eyal Bor on the clarinet, uh, and this is a piece called Sholom Aleichem Rov Feidman uh, by Bela Kovacs, a wonderful Hungarian clarinetist, one of the best of our generation, uh, born in 1937. Uh, this really is a tribute uh, to the tradition of klezmer clarinet, uh, which we're going to hear a lot of in this program, uh, this music arising out of the shtetls of Eastern Europe, uh, the Ashkenazi Jews, and uh, eventually makes its way across to America. And there it blends uh, with the jazz coming up from uh, the south uh, to become really our American jazz. It also makes its way to Palestine as more people uh, headed there. So it's become this uh, wonderful universal music. Uh, and we'll also hear how it blends with the, the chants and the rituals of the synagogue and the liturgical music uh, as we hear this first piece. Uh, Kovacs uh, wrote this in uh, 1980, uh, and it's uh, called Shalom Aleichem Rov Feidman, Peace Be With You, uh, to Master Feidman. Uh, Feidman is Giorda Feidman, uh, one of the great clarinetists of his, of his time, born in Buenos Aires of, in 1936. His uh, Jewish parents had immigrated there, uh, and then uh, he eventually emigrates to become one of the youngest members of the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra uh, in the 1950s. Uh, he's done many recordings, including uh, playing on the film score of Schindler's List, uh, Kovacs, uh, the, the composer, uh, has been a part of the Budapest Philharmonic Orchestra, the Franz Liszt Academy of Music, and was also the principal clarinetist of the Hungarian State Orchestra. So you'll hear in this piece the slow beginning, uh, getting faster and faster, until at the end you'll want to get up and dance a little bit. So please enjoy Sholom Aleichem, Rob Feidman by Bela Kovacs. Thank you. 
Our next piece will feature our cellist, Francis Barofsky, uh, who will be playing Ernest Bloch's um, prayer from his sweet Jewish life, from Jewish life that he writes in 1924. He actually wrote this piece while he was vacationing in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and he wrote it for cellist Hans Kindler, who had earlier premiered his very famous Shlomo, uh, his concerto for cello and orchestra that he wrote in 1917. Uh, and this piece really uses the, the liturgical modes, the Jewish modes, notably the Ahara Rabbah. Uh, Bloch was born in Geneva in 1880, uh, and though he was from a Jewish family, they were not a very observant family, um, but he starts composing very early, at the age of seven, uh, and uh, he actually uh, worked for a while in his father's business as a cuckoo clock and music box baker, uh, gets married in 1904, has a few children, including one uh, who became uh, Lucien, a very important photographer uh, in America, uh, photographed a lot of Diego Rivera works in the uh, Rockefeller Center. Um, around 1912, uh, where, when he was appointed the professor of uh, composition in Geneva, he began to rediscover his Jewish origin. Uh, as he says, uh, he wrote to a friend, I have just read the Bible, and an immense sense of pride surged in me. My entire being vibrated. It is a revelation. I found myself again a Jew. I raise my head proudly as a Jew. And he later, describing his Jewish period for the next six years, I am a Jew and I aspire to write Jewish music, not for the sake of self-advertisement, but because I am sure that this is the only way in which I can produce music of vitality and significance, if I can do such a thing at all. I believe that those pages of my own in which I aim at my best are those in which I am almost most unmistakably racial, but the racial quality is not only in the folk themes, it is in myself. It is not my purpose, not my desire to attempt a reconstitution of Jewish music or to base my work on melodies more or less authentic. I am not an archaeologist. It is the Jewish soul that interests me, the complex, glowing, agitated soul that I feel vibrating throughout the Bible, the violence of the prophetic books, the savage love of justice, the despair of the preachers in Jerusalem, the sensuality of the Song of Songs. All this is in us is in me, and it is the better part of me. It is all that I endeavor to hear in myself and to just transcribe in my music the venerable emotion of the race that slumbers way down in our souls. Uh, please welcome uh, Francis Borowski, uh, Ernest Bloch's Prayer.
Our next piece will feature violinist Emmanuel Barofsky uh, and a wonderful uh, piece, The Hebrew Melody by Joseph Akra, uh, who was born in a small Lithuanian town in 1886. His father actually built him his first violin when he was two years old. Uh, and uh, by the time he was four, he had written his first few pieces. Uh, the family then moved uh, to Warsaw so that he could attend the Warsaw Conservatory. And by the time he was 10, he was doing a concert tour of the Russian Empire and was dubbed the Wunderchild. Uh, performing for the Tsar's brother and more. Uh, he then enters the St. Petersburg Conservatory where he studied with the renowned pedagogue Leopold Auer who taught all the great violinists, Heifetz and Misha Elman. Um, and again, he was not uh, strongly Jewish as a young boy, uh, but by, when he uh, enters the St. Petersburg Conservatory, there's a, a society uh, of uh, Jewish folk music that gets started, uh, and he gets invited uh, to join the committee of that, uh, and becomes uh, sort of desires of developing a Jewish idiom. And in fact, he runs home after one of the first meetings in 1911, and he writes this Hebrew melody, uh, one of the first pieces that he wrote, uh, and remains to this day one of his most popular popular ones. Uh, Heifetz actually played this piece with his pianist Isidore Akron, uh, the brother, uh, in 1911. Uh, ultimately, Akron would open up a new branch of this uh, Jewish folk music society uh, in Kharkov, uh, where he taught at the conservatory, uh, and he did uh, extensive tours uh, around Russia, ultimately moving to Berlin, and then later to Palestine, and then eventually making his way to America in 1924, where he taught at the Westchester Conservatory of Music, uh, and then later in the 1930s, out to Los Angeles, where he worked for a while in the film industry. Uh, the great Arnold Schoenberg uh, wrote in the obituary about Akron, he said, he is one of the most underrated modern composers. The originality and profound elaboration of his ideas guarantee that his works will last forever. Here is Emanuel Borowski, The Hebrew Melody by Joseph Akron.
going to bring back uh, Eyal uh, for uh, one last solo work. Uh, and this is a piece by Lev Kogan, a name that is very uh, rarely heard. Uh, he was actually a Russian composer born in 1927, uh, who ultimately moved to Israel in 1972. Uh, but he also was influenced by the Society for Jewish Folk Music in the Moscow chapter that had been started by uh, Jacob Weinberg. Uh, he was a composition student of Aram Kachaturian at the Moscow State Conservatory uh, between 1946 and 1952. Uh, and he was still able, even in the, uh, the time of Stalin, to, to get some of this Jewish folk music out there. And to be began to uh, discover and research uh, Yiddish folk music. Uh, and by the time he moves to uh, Israel, lives in uh, Haifa, uh, in, dies there in 2007, uh, he had written many, many pieces. And this is a piece called the Hasidic Tunes uh, for clarinet and piano. We're going to do three out of the ten tunes that he wrote. This he wrote in 1980. Here is Dr. Bohr, Lev Kogan's Hasidic Tunes.
piece is by another composer that has uh, largely been forgotten. His name is Joel Engel, um, although originally his name was Yulia Dmitrievich Engel, uh, born in uh, Ukraine uh, in, in 1868. And he's really considered the father of the modern renaissance of Jewish music that began uh, in the first part of the, of the 20th century uh, in Russia, in St. Petersburg, and began to spread. Uh, and this is what uh, we're going to focus on for much of the rest of the concert. Uh, he really wanted to rediscover uh, the Jewish roots of, his, of the music and to go back into the shtetl to write down as an ethnomusicologist some of this uh, oral tradition music that was going to be lost. Uh, and in fact, uh, he had uh, gone to conservatory at the urging of Tchaikovsky, uh, and he enters the Moscow Conservatory, uh, and he worked with a guy named Vladimir Stasov, who was very influential in collecting Russian folk music. And Stasov was the one who said, where is the national pride in your own people? Uh, sort of getting that, uh, the switch to go off for Engel that he needed to go and collect some of this Jewish folk music. And so he began around the year 1900 uh, to go back to his village and write down some of these Yiddish folk melodies and began a long lecture concert circuit around Moscow and St. Petersburg to make sure people heard this music. And in fact, uh, he was one of the first to use uh, the wax cylinders of uh, Thomas Edison's recently um, invented photograph, much like Bartok did a few years earlier. Uh, he brought that out into all of these far-flung places of the Russian Empire uh, and wrote down uh, and, and, and uh, recorded uh, these uh, Jewish folk uh, artists. Uh, he was uh, the, one of the founders of the Society for Jewish Folk Music that begins in 1908, which included uh, some of the young stars uh, of the time, Joseph Akron, who we heard, uh, Piatigorsky on cello, Heifetz on violin, uh, all played uh, in some of these concerts uh, to showcase uh, this new music. Uh, he ultimately would uh, move to uh, uh, Berlin for a few years, uh, where he opened the Yuval Publishing House there, uh, and then later uh, uh, went down to Palestine in 1924, uh, where he taught at the Shulamit Music School uh, and began to try to develop a, an indigenous style there using some of the Yemenite melodies that he heard. Um, and was one of the uh, uh, leaders of the, the first theater groups there in Palestine. Uh, it was difficult being down there. As he said, I was pampered when I was in Moscow and Berlin. Here, no one knows what Engel the composer write, wrote then and what he is writing now. And sadly, he dies in 1927. And as I say, he's been largely forgotten, although uh, for a while his music dominated the popular music scene in Palestine. You may even know some of his songs, Numi Numi, uh, one of Israel's most popular lullabies, and uh, Omrim Yeshna Eretz, among others. Uh, so we're going to play a trio that he wrote um, around 1911, right around this time, called Freilax, uh, the joyous music. And I think you'll hear uh, some of that great Jewish folk music in it. Uh, here is uh, Joseph, Joel Engel's Freilax. Thank you. 
people to the stage here, Dara Fitzgerald on violin and Radames Santos on viola, and do a, a larger work uh, that was arranged and written uh, by a living composer, Mayira Warshauer, uh, who is down in South Carolina right now, uh, he teaches at Columbia College, uh, and is uh, very much, uh, lots of her output, uh, her output as a composer are uh, uh, Jewish themes and how they sort of relate to the universal message of healing and peace uh, and, and struggle. Um, as uh, Ina Esther Yust, uh, who the principal cellist of the Jerusalem Symphony observed, Meira's music comes from a place which is beyond music. It is like a prayer from deep within the soul and always evokes deep responses from the listeners. Now this piece that we're going to play, she wrote in 2001, it's called Yiddish Fantasy, and it's a fun work which uh, includes several different uh, tunes you will recognize, uh, starting with Vuis uh, Dus Gesele, Where's This Little Street, um, which takes us back to the, the shtetl, the little villages there in Euro Eastern Europe. Uh, then we go to Oyan uh, Pripachuk on the Little Hearth. Uh, a very well-known piece composed by uh, Mark Warshawski, uh, where we can sort of look through the window at the children as they gather around the hearth. 
Uh, then we go to Roshinkis mit Mandolin, Raisins and Almonds, a very famous work by Abe Goldfaden, a uh, very popular lullaby, uh, and then three dance tunes to, fi to finish it, a Russian Sher, and then two Freilachs uh, to bring us home in this wonderful journey uh, through the Yiddish uh, music. So we thank Mayeda Warshaw for this wonderful piece, A Yiddish Fantasy.
All right, we're going to bring back uh, Dr. Bohr uh, and have him play with the full string quartet here while I take a little break and we hear this uh, wonderful work by another composer who has largely been uh, sadly forgotten, Alexander Krein, uh, born in 1883, dies in 1951. And this is his piece called Jewish Sketches, Opus 12, that he writes in 1912. Uh, Krein came from a, a klezmer family. His father was a, a well-known uh, violinist who played all over, and there were seven other children, seven other boys in the family who were all musicians, including uh, his brother Gregory, a uh, composer, um, and David, who was the concertmaster of the Bolshoi Ballet in Moscow uh, for many years. Um, Krein studies at the Moscow Conservatory, graduates in 1908, and he had developed this very original style combining the kind of new harmonic language of the Impressionists like Debussy and Ravel uh, with uh, Scriabin, one of the great Russian composers who was very inventive, and then combining that with some of the modes of Jewish folk music. Um, and he met up with Joel Engel, uh, the composer of that trio, and Engel was the one who encouraged him uh, to write some of his own melodies uh, with this klezmer tradition that he knew. And that's where this piece comes out of in 1910, and uh, uh, his, uh, that uses both the Jewish folk, the klezmer music, and the kind of liturgical melodies. We'll hear that in the second movement, a beautiful cello solo uh, in that. Uh, Krein never left uh, uh, the Soviet Union and uh, wrote some kind of good propaganda music. In 1926, uh, he wrote the Funeral Ode in Memory of Lenin, and in 1932, he wrote a symphonic piece called the USSR Shock Brigade of the World Proletariat. Um, and he was awarded the title of Honored Artist of the Soviet Union in 1934. So it was kind of amazing that a Jewish composer could do that. Uh, but uh, he sort of played the game as it needed to be played. Uh, his second symphony from 1945 is a very powerful meditation on the historic sufferings of the Jewish people from the ancient times all the way up to the Holocaust. So I urge you uh, to look a little bit about Alexander Krein. I mean, hope you enjoy these Jewish sketches, three of them, Opus 12.
Our final work on the program uh, will bring everybody together on the stage at once. Uh, and this is the only piece on the program not actually written by a Jewish composer, uh, but it's called The Overture on Hebrew Themes. And it's probably the most famous of the works written by Sergei Prokofiev, uh, who, though not Jewish, had gone to school with so many of these uh, uh, people interested in the Jewish uh, music. And so he was friends with them as students. And this piece was the result of an amazing convergence in uh, uh, America in 1919. Prokofiev had come to do his opera, The Love for Three Oranges, uh, in Chicago. Uh, and at the same time, there was a wonderful ensemble called the Zimro Ensemble, led by uh, Simeon Belisar, a very well-known clarinetist uh, who would ultimately become the uh, concertmaster of the New York Philharmonic for many years. Uh, but Bellison had formed this group uh, filled with a number of these young St. Petersburg students who were very interested in this Jewish music and especially a Zionist sort of feel. And in fact, Zimro, coming from the word Zmer, klezmer, meaning singing, uh, 
their idea was to uh, disseminate and collect Jewish folk music in Russia and then to get all the income from concerts to fund the building of a cathedral of art in Palestine uh, and to establish this Palestinian conservatory. And so in 1918, after they were formed in Petrograd, the, what was St. Petersburg, uh, they began a long tour going all the way to the east, to Siberia and Japan and Indonesia and Hawaii and Alaska, places, uh, uh, crazy places, ultimately across over to San Francisco and into Chicago, uh, playing this music and uh, kind of amazed the people who heard this in a real concert form. These were all phenomenal uh, performers. And so not only they played uh, more normal classical music, but added to this this uh, Jewish ensemble and made it really sound like it was meant to be part of the Western tradition. Um, and uh, it was in uh, Chicago where they met up with Prokofiev who heard them play at a Zionist convention there and uh, they sort of all got together and uh, we think that uh, uh, Bel uh, Belasan said, I have some wonderful pieces in my notebook of uh, klezmer tunes, maybe you could come up with something. Uh, and Prokofiev did uh, put together two of these uh, tunes, one which was more of a, a faster a klezmer tune and one a kind of a more uh, a wedding song uh, that was sung. Uh, that uh, had been collected by Belisong. Uh And here's uh, Prokofiev's diary uh, from 1920, talked about the, the premiere. He said, uh, the premiere took place at the Bohemian Club in Chicago, uh, which uh, organized a reception for me on the occasion of this first performance of my overture on Jewish themes. It was a closed event, members only, about 80 people. Then the Zimro lot performed the, ba the Brahms clarinet quintet, which was serious and very boring. Then variations by Genesis, Ganesin, which were the same as boring. And then my overture. The overture sounded quite fine after the previous dead numbers. Uh, and it was so lively and fresh that the auditorium came to life and gave me a vociferous ovation. Uh, and you'll really uh, feel uh, the excitement of this music. Uh, and we are really uh, glad to be a part of this first Wednesday uh, here at Beth El. And we hope you enjoy Prokofiev's overture on the Hebrew themes.
enjoyed uh, this concert and again uh, to find out more about concerts coming up uh, check out uh, classicopia.org that's classic with an O-P-I-A and we hope you can join us for more of our upcoming programs. Thanks for being a part of it. Bye-bye.